Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, I think, to the BIP Global Investment Strategy Overview ahead of our investment committee meetings that we that are kicking off from tomorrow. Uh, what I'm going to do today is just follow up on what my colleague uh, Pierre did early in the morning in Afrikaans to just take you through our main arguments or the main arguments that are informing our portfolio positioning for the next three months. You will start to receive our detailed um, investment research packs um, effective from tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon at the earliest, otherwise Thursday morning at the latest, where you find where you will find more detail supporting the rather summarized views. I'm going to take you through for the next um, for the next hour or so. There is a chance uh, towards the end of the presentation, I will just open up for a few more questions. Should that not happen because of time limits, uh, do not worry. You can send your, your questions to us via email, and then we can address them before our investment committee meeting with you by email, as well as during your investment committee meeting. So I'm just going to quickly start, um, and then by, by highlighting what we are primarily concerned with um, in this particular quarter. When everything is said and done, what is very important to any policymaker in the world, be it on the fiscal policy side or on the monetary policy side, is that the nature of earnings growth, which are being generated by economic growth in any economy, does not come with the erosion of the real capital or the real wealth of investors and citizens at large. So essentially, policymakers like economic growth and earnings growth for as long as that does not come with inflation. The moment that comes with inflation, there is often a response or an intervention to either increase your aggregate supply, which then ensures inflation, or to reduce aggregate demand. Whenever policymakers interfere by increasing aggregate supply to manage inflation, that way of disinflating the economy is very bullish for equities. But when they do that by reducing aggregate demand as they are doing now and as we will show you as we progress, then that is generally not a good thing for equities and is very bullish for bonds. Naturally, BIP has taken the stance that a lot of the methods that are being used currently by different central banks to manage inflation have to do with reducing aggregate demand, which ultimately means you reduce economic growth. And that ultimately means you reduce, um, you reduce earnings growth. And that is generally not a positive thing for equities until it is clear that central banks have achieved what they want to achieve. So it, it ends up looking like a macroeconomic um, environment, a macroeconomic discussion for asset allocation. But for all of you that are familiar with the process, you will know that we look beyond uh, the macroeconomic picture. But the most important point is that when inflation becomes a primary focus point or the primary medicine that has to be applied to the inflation disease, policymakers often keep on applying the medication regardless of what the side effects are. And I think many of you that are on medication in any way whatsoever would be aware that behind any medical box you take are disclaimers on side effects. Um, that is unavoidable consequences of taking that. And what we are starting to see in this environment is a lot of unavoidable consequences of tight monetary policy. And generally, those suggest that the central bank has gone a little bit too far in trying to contain inflation. And therefore, the risks, in particular downside risk for earnings, become very, very elevated. As we go through the coming slides, I think you'll start to see a lot of the side effects we're seeing today are really not new to this environment. They pretty much always happen in any capital market cycle and always they're always the same debates and they're always the same outcomes and I think for us that is very encouraging because the capital preservation mode or stance we've taken since May last year remains very valid if anything our conviction that we should continue to focus on protecting capital um, the hard-end capital that um, our clients have entrusted to us I think that conviction has become higher than ever before to start off um, this presentation, I'm going to look at a paper that was presented by Janet Yellen in 2012. And the reason why she was presenting on this particular piece is because a lot of the attendants at that conference were trying to understand directly from her how she knows how to prioritize between inflation and growth. I think therein, a lot of the investors attending this conference 
just wanted to understand if there is a point where economic growth is so weak that the Fed starts to focus on defending growth and does not really care about inflation. And essentially, the answer that Janet Yellen gave is that um, ultimately, when you're dealing with monetary policy, there are two primary things that are very important. The first one, I think if you look at what these uh, equations are saying, is inflation, where this particular, um, I think, um, like symbol, which we call pi in mathematics or statistics, represents the current level of inflation. And then the pi star represents the Fed's target, in which case we're talking about 2% for core CPI. And then the next one, which is your labor market, ultimately a growth control mechanism. Again, there you see that uh, the mean um, or the equilibrium employment, um, sorry, the, the, this mean is pretty much representing unemployment, which is the current rate. And then the mean star is pretty much the target of unemployment. And I think what Janet Yellen was trying to say is that the sum of these two things must always equate to the smallest number they don't actually care how they achieve the smallest number. They just do whatever it takes to get to the smallest number, which is really, which is pretty much what they refer to as the optimal control of what um of their of their of their of their of their goals. So if we start off with today's environment, you will realize that the problem really is not around unemployment versus the target. If anything, current levels of unemployment are quite close to where the Fed is supposed to maintain them at. The reason why this number is unusually large is because the difference between prevailing inflation and optimal inflation is extremely elevated. And the Fed is going to do whatever they need to do to make sure that the sum of these two is quite small, which essentially means they need to hike rates until they get there. A very quick back envelope calculation based on this particular formula to try and understand the degree of unemployment that has to be created to achieve the inflation target is pretty much shown on the on the charts to the right and what this is just showing is that if the fed is serious about bringing inflation back to two percent they have to be willing to weaken the labor market from the current levels i think of about 3.5 percent all the way to 6.7 percent which is quite meaningful destruction of aggregate demand a different way of um of making this point across is to say if you are dealing with the deflation regime, which is essentially where we were at uh, from 2008, essentially, all the way to 2019, what often happens in deflation is that inflation is not a problem. And the problem is that your economic growth is too weak to generate inflation. So the Fed will do anything to boost employment or they'll do anything to boost aggregate demand. Any hint of negative news, they quickly back off and they start to introduce quantitative easing as well as rate cuts. So their reaction function is to always defend economic growth. Their reaction function is to do whatever it takes to create positive economic news. However, once you're dealing with inflation, the reaction function becomes opposite. In this particular case, you do everything as the central bank to develop, to, to create bad economic news because bad economic news means you're weakening aggregate demand. Weak aggregate demand means you're controlling inflation. So the biggest risk I think today is that Markets could be positioning for the same reaction function that the Fed was using to fight deflation instead of positioning for the reaction function when the Fed is keen on controlling inflation. And I think this is why every time the Fed comes out and is determined in its communication to fight inflation, you find that markets sell off quite aggressively. And when, whenever the Fed looks like it's it's unsure whether to continue with rate hikes or not, markets rally. But essentially, I think the underlying point is that markets seem to appear to want the Fed to continue to react as it did between 2008 and 2019, and that may not necessarily be the optimal way to respond or else equal. So if we look at this particular equation and if the Fed manages inflation according to the optimal control, the, the risk today is that the manner in which or the extent to which the Fed is determined to cause a recession so that it can control inflation is potentially a lot higher than the, what the market is prepared for. If we look at this very simplistic chart, I mean, it just gives you a sense of the difference between global aggregate demand and global aggregate supply. Whenever global aggregate demand is the heavier one on this particular scale, meaning that we've got higher global aggregate demand compared to global aggregate supply, we end up with inflation, which you can see on the chart to the right, 
And in this particular case, uh, case we are focusing on core CPI. To the extent that this is being caused by global aggregate demand, the only way you can solve it is to reduce or to destroy global aggregate demand until the scale is balanced. And in fact, until inflation comes back all the way to this um, red line. And as you can see, the most positive development so far this year is that inflation is definitely peaked. The most negative development is that the manner in which disinflation is happening is extremely slow, very frustrating, and very unpredictable. However, one of the most important things when you look at this particular level of inflation and we go back to the optimal control curve, what becomes very clear to us is that the determination or the need for disinflation by the Fed is as high as at any other particular point in time, maybe until they get into these one sigma bands. What is far more important, however, from an asset allocation perspective is to be very clear if the method of disinflation is equity bullish or bond bullish. If policymakers solve for, for, for these levels of inflation by increasing aggregate supply until aggregate supply is dominating aggregate demand, that is very bullish for economic growth, that is bullish for earnings growth, that is bullish for equities. However, if central banks manage inflation by reducing global aggregate demand, that is what we refer to as bad disinflation, and bad disinflation is bond bullish. And one of the strongest views from the BIP investments team right now is that we are not going to ever focus on how fast we think disinflation is going to be, although in a couple of slides from now we'll tackle that particular subject, what we do know without an ounce of doubt is that the current strategy of managing inflation is bad disinflation because it is focusing on weakening global aggregate demand. And all else equal bad disinflation is bonds bullish. And when you look at the current positioning of the BIP portfolios, the multiple multi-asset balance funds, the global specialist building block mandates, as well as the local specialist building block mandates, one thing that is extremely clear is that we're bullish on local and um, global bonds to the extent of almost 20%, 10% local and roughly 10% on the, on the global side, essentially because of this very clear macro argument that we have. What we obviously, what is definitely going to frustrate us is that as long as we're taking the stance we are very vulnerable to the one quarter or two quarters when equity markets outperform bonds. But for as long as history is going to repeat itself, ultimately this environment ends up with bonds winning over equities. And that's pretty much, I think, the bet we've taken in all of our portfolios. And that is also the one that protects capital the most as opposed to one where you try to actively trade the equity market. One of the reasons why we're quite confident in a bond bullish stance, uh, bond bullish stance, I think being the primary word for our positioning, is if you just look at the Fed um, dot plot, uh, which is pretty much in this um, red text box, and you look at the stance that the Fed has taken for 2023, you will realize that the majority of the policymakers or decision makers on the central, on that central committee, are expecting interest rates to remain above five percent uh, this year. The Fed itself believes that the neutral rate of interest rate, which is the interest rate where you neither have inflation or disinflation, and the interest rate where you shouldn't really have any economic recession is 2.5%. The fact that the Fed is now gunning for double that rate with quite a number of participants expecting interest rates to even go further than 5% means that the Fed is actually operating within this optimal control curve where they don't look at the side effects of the, of the medicine, they continue to apply the medicine until inflation has come back into these one sigma bands. So just looking at this, what becomes very clear to us is that the determination of the Fed is not necessarily to fight with equity investors or bond investors, but to stay within process, which is exactly what any other investor would expect of the Fed or of any asset manager. Stick to your process and we will know what type of um, investment decision framework we're supporting. And I think that's essentially what the Fed is doing at this point in time. If we look at um, different strategies that we follow, the BCA, for example, thinks that that neutral rate is actually much closer to 4% and not the 2.5% that the Fed thinks it is. Now, the debate of whether it is 2.5% or whether it is 4% is actually irrelevant, especially because the Fed has already gone above those rates 
And the moment you have got interest rates above what the neutral rate is, you have moved from a tightening phase to a euphoric phase. In a euphoric phase, the downside risk that comes with equities is significantly higher than the downside risk that comes to defensive assets like bonds. So for us, the argument of whether it's 2.54% or whatever doesn't really matter because of where the Fed currently is or where the Fed is communicating they want to go. Either way, we get a clear answer that the downside risk of equities is higher than bonds, and we then ensure that our portfolios are preserving capital, they're maximizing yield, and they are bond bullish, and we've got the right bond managers or else equal. If we look at Alpine Macro, our different investment research provider, the argument gets very complicated in the sense that they actually are arguing that the neutral rate is closer to 1% and has been reducing with every recession that has come by. Obviously, the biggest argument is that the response to a lot of these recessions was the accumulation of debt. The more debt you have, the more vulnerable you are to rate hikes or the, the less resistant you are to interest rate hikes. And hence the reason why the neutral rate is reducing. So I think what you can Im immediately see is for, for a decision maker or an asset allocator, you either get caught up in deciding whether the neutral rate is 1%, 4%, or 2.5%, or you just accept that regardless of what you think it is, the Fed is determined to keep interest rates significantly higher than any answer you have to the neutral rate. And the moment the Fed is taking that stance, you are in a euphoric scenario. And from a capital protection basis, you're better off with defensive assets like bonds or uncorrelated assets like the US dollar and gold, which are some of the primary positions across many BIP portfolios in this current market environment. If we then look at the market itself, and um, we so far looked at three particular very important players in the market. We started off with, with um, we essentially with the Fed's own view of where the neutral rate is. We looked at the BCA, which represents quite a big number of strategists in the market. We also looked at up and macro. And if we come back again now um, to the market and we forget the Fed, you, you realize that the market is actually very, very, very bullish around what the neutral rate of interest rate is there is a very high chance the market thinks that the neutral rate of interest rates is lower than what up and macro thinks, is lower than what the BCA thinks, and is lower than what the Fed itself thinks because of the speed at which they expect the Fed to cut rates. You can only expect the Fed to cut rates that fast in 2023 if you believe that they've hiked rates extremely aggressively. Otherwise, if, if the market believed the Fed was very close to the neutral rate, they wouldn't ex expect such an aggressive rate um, tightening. The Fed, on the other hand, as you can see, is in no hurry to cut interest rates at all, meaning that they prefer a tight policy and they believe maybe the neutral rate is higher. And essentially here, BIP then leans on the old mantra that do not fight the Fed when trying to allocate hard end capital that is not yours but belongs to clients that are relying on you to protect that as much as possible. Our biggest, biggest worry today is that if the Fed happens to be correct and the market is wrong and the market reprices, then we essentially back to October 2022 and the market repriced to high interest rates and that caused quite a deep sell-off. If you then look at our views that, that we're looking at, for example, from the BCA, where this particular chart where my case is, is the BCA just trying to give you a sense of saying, how fast is disinflation going to be in this particular year of 2023? And the way they have done this is to run a lot of the inflation models. And then they do calculate the probability that inflation is higher than 3%, 4%, or 5% by the end of 2023. In fact, the fact that they're calculating the probability that inflation is higher than 3, 4, 5% by May next year, because they're looking at this over the next 24 months. If you look at this particular model, they think the probability that inflation is higher than 3% in the next 12 months is 100%. 3% is 100 basis of what the Fed wants to achieve. If the BCA is correct, and if the Fed stays within the optimal control function, then there's a very high chance the Fed is going to keep rates elevated much, much longer than the market is prepared. That is a very binary risk backdrop to even try and take a bet on. If the market is wrong and the Fed is right, then there's going to be a meaningful destruction of capital in the next 12 months. If the market is right and the Fed is wrong, then maybe the Fed is going to start uh, to cut um, interest rates 
But typically, the Fed will never cut interest rates until they've destroyed something in the underlying economy. So both of those outcomes generally are not positive for growth assets. A very, very simple way of just arguing what I've just said is to say, the only way the market can be correct and the Fed wrong is if we're going to have very, very fast disinflation in the next 12 months. If we have fast disinflation in the next 12 months, we're going to have a very aggressive increase in real interest rates in the next 12 months. All, as many of you are aware, nominal interest rates are negative for economic growth, but real rates that are going higher are far more disastrous for growth assets. So essentially, the market is essentially saying that there's going to be a very aggressive increase in real rates in the next 12 months. And they are then taking a bet that because the Fed is, is not going to like high rates, it's going to cut interest rates very, very fast. So essentially, you start to take a gamble around the speed at which the Fed is going to cut rates as soon as your real rates are elevated. The Fed itself has communicated that it wants to take rates as high as possible, keep that in a pause for as long as possible before they cut, meaning that they are not going to be intimidated by, how, by high real interest rates. And because high real rates are very dangerous for growth assets, we still think it's not worthwhile, I think, positioning in favor with what the market is expecting and rather position based on what the Fed has said and then re-risk our portfolios only if the Fed makes a different decision. So all else equal, looking at a lot of these things, we would still maintain a very bullish stance on bonds uh, for defensive assets and uncorrelated assets like gold um, on the other hand. You are all very familiar with this particular chart, which BIP Investments Team has been using, I think, for the last six quarters or so. And in short, what this particular chart was trying to achieve is to say, if you look at the effect of earnings on the equity value, so maybe to just re rewind, this particular uh, text box where my case is currently is trying to give you a sense of the value of an equity or the equity market based on a constant interest rate of 5%. And what is happening here is we're seeing a reduction in earnings from 100 to 90 to 80, all the way to 60. And what you can see is that a 10% reduction in earnings is equal to 10% reduction in the equity market. 20% reduction in earnings, 20%. So the effect is linear. However, if you freeze your earnings and you start to increase interest rates, what becomes automatically obvious is that the effect of interest rates on valuations is far more significant than the effect of earnings. So a 1% increase in rates is a 17% downside, 2% is a 30% downside, 3% is almost 40, and the risk goes on. What I'm actually trying to point out this particular quarter, which is quite different from what we've been arguing in the prior quarters to say, if you reverse the direction of this where your rates, instead of having rate increases, you start to have rate cuts, the effect on equity markets is very dramatic, meaning that a quick um, rate cutting cycle is extremely bullish for equities and a slow rate cutting cycle is extremely negative for equities. So if you position in line with the markets and you position for extremely fast rate cuts, essentially what you will, if you are correct, you should have all else equal an extremely fast reflation of the equity market or a rally in the equity market. However, if you have a, a very slow rate cutting process, it actually may lead into a much deeper recession and a much equity market, um, much deeper equity market sell-off. And essentially, again, asset allocation becomes a very binary view. Do you position in line with what the Fed is communicating? or in line with what the market is communicating. What we have done with the BIP portfolios is to position in line with what the Fed is communicating. However, we have created what we call the BIP re-risking criteria, which is quite ready to change our positioning from the red line to the blue line in the event that the Fed also changing, changes their views to align to the market. So the worst case that could happen is that we reposition our portfolio slowly, which we feel is a much more responsible risk than positioning against the Fed and it turns out you're wrong and you destroy a lot of value. In any case, a lot of the bonds we hold now are high duration bonds, which do phenomenally well whenever the Fed cuts rates at a pace as fast as what the markets expect. So either way, we don't think we will lose out a lot in that particular scenario. So a very simple way of explaining everything I said is that at this particular point in time, you either choose equity market risk or earnings risk if you think the market is correct,
or you take duration risk if you think the Fed is correct. The benefit of duration risk is that bonds do extremely well whenever the Fed is cutting rates fast. Just to give you a sense of what I mean by that, if you look at the 10-year bond yield in the US right now, if that is going to rally from roughly 3.5% today to 2.5%, that is an upside of almost 16 or 17%, which is pretty much an equity return. And I think we would rather bet on duration risk than earnings risk until this big disparity between the Fed and the market has been resolved. There's, all, all, there's obviously an argument of how some of the earnings um, or valuations are starting to look very good. There is no way we're going to rely on short-term earnings to make decisions for asset allocation for our clients' hard-earned capital in this environment. If we really are going to lean into the valuation discussion, what we are actually going to do is to rather use uh, your long-term valuations where the earnings are smoothed out. What, what, it, what is immediately obvious to BIP is this particular chart. What this chart is trying to do, which we've again discussed with you in a lot of our prior investment committee meetings, is work done by the BCA to try and understand when are valuations very important when you're trying to make asset allocation decisions. And on the, on the horizontal axis is the number of years, starting from one year all the way to 12. And then on the, on the vertical axis is a number starting from 10 to 80. This particular number is giving a sense of the percentage or the, the proportion of performance that is directly explained by valuations over these different time periods. So over a period of one year, which is between now and May next year, valuations explain almost 5% of the performance profile, which means that positioning your asset at your portfolios based on today's valuations is not going to help you over the next year because performance is only, a, it's only affected by value less than 20 and over three is about 30 percent what this automatically tells us is that although we're very clear what today's long-term valuations are on all of these different asset classes what is extremely obvious to us is that in the short term this doesn't matter so obviously for bip clients will come to us and say please can you position our portfolios with the three of you or longer we will use this this to gauge what what our risk appetite is However, if it is very clear that any of our clients is very concerned about capital protection over the next three years, then valuations are not the, are not the tool to decide uh, to use to decide asset allocation. So what I'm really just trying to put across here is that we have clients within the BIP client pool. We have been a very explicit to say they're taking a three of you or longer. For those particular clients, we are definitely using this particular valuation picture to position the asset allocation. And I'll take you through those slides a little bit later. But for clients who are saying, listen, our clients really need this money. They want to maximize the income and they want to get out of this particular crisis with as much capital as possible. We, whilst we understand valuations, we're very clear that over the next three years, they really are insignificant for ultimate performance. And there we're actually relying more on the business risk considerations. And business risk considerations typically are a more effective tool for protecting capital over the one to three years, but over the long term, they mean nothing. So essentially, we're, we're balancing out the two, but depending on the client's risk appetite. And if we look at our own traditional measures of, of recession risk, the risk of recession is extremely high, which means that we're definitely very defensive for clients who are very conscious of their performance and capital protection in the next three years and less defensive for clients who only want to focus on long-term valuations. These clients obviously have to be content with long, big drawdown short-term, but in the long-term, it actually doesn't matter. They'll make up for that unless they, they make very, very drastic asset allocation adjustments at the wrong time. So with all of that background in place, we're just going to go back into time and just look at a lot of um, examples that are giving the BIP Investments Committee conviction to run portfolios, which are very defensive, which have got very high duration risk, because on the long end of the local and global curve is where you've got the highest yield. And that's also, in our view, giving much better capital protection than equities. So essentially, we're going to take you through arguments to explain or to help you understand why our conviction on capital protection and yield maximization has been increasing since we started de-risking our portfolios around this time last year.
if I start off uh, with this particular chart, I think one the theme of the next 10 or so slides is that there is always an argument. There is always an argument, but although there is always an argument, the facts actually never really change. So what we mean by that is if you look at this particular mark, um, uh, chart on the left, it is one of the things that come up when you listen to any global investment strategist, they will find a macro regime which they believe is the best representative of, of what is happening today. Two of the most common macro regimes that have been chosen is this 1981 or 1982 regime, which is pretty much, I think, um, this one to the left, or the 2001 or 2002 regime, which is the one to the right. What I just want to leave you with is, is that, um, so, and in all of those regimes, there's one other thing I think that is very, very important. In this very first one, where we're comparing the 1981 or 82 regime to today, you'll realize that the olive green um, chart is the market's performance so far. And then this dark, I'm just going to call it black to make it easy. This dark black line is essentially what was happening in 1981 or 82. What is clear from the H1, 82 regime is that the sell-off process or the bear market process or the capital preservation period actually came up with a lot, came with a lot of relief rallies that ended with lower lows and lower lows before the ultimate rally. And in all of these cases, this ultimate rally did not happen until there was an aggressive rally by the bond market in response to aggressive rate cuts by the Fed. So the equity market did not rally until the bond market rallied. The bond market did not rally until the Fed cut interest rates and hence the pathway we have taken to start off with bullish bets in bonds on the long duration, moving that to equities if we get the call right, and then obviously back to benchmark um, SAA once all of this is played out. If you then look at the same uh, regime in 2001 or 2002, it is also quite interesting that the profile is the same. In the capital preservation period, which lasted about two years or so, Equity markets had a lot of relief rallies, but with each relief rally came a lower low and a lower low. And a simpler way of saying everything that I've said is that it actually doesn't matter which regime you, you choose. 1981 or 82, the 1970s, 2001, 2002, 2022, 2023, I think the argument is that a lot of bear markets have the same profile. There's a very first part where equity markets sell off because the interest rate has been increased, then the second part where as your earnings are now contracting in response to tighter financial conditions, equity markets sell off again. And sometimes the sell of the manner in which earnings recession happens is so dirty that markets, um, market participants are panic and then they sell out in this liquidation phase. So if you look at our commentary, the bullish camp in the markets will argue that um, markets can only price a recession once, so they can only be one low and not two or three lows. And essentially, this would be the camp of investment strategies like Alpha and Macro. But looking at a lot of these regimes, it is very clear that although the market started pricing in a recession earlier, there were lower lows, meaning that this recession was priced more and more negatively as reality started to money first. The bearish camp obviously just look, um, looks at how the, the lows get worse and worse, and also often refer to the anatomy of this. But in general, I think BIP has taken the stance of saying, if this is how many bear markets have looked like in the past, why would we take a chance and position portfolios in a manner that is different, especially if it's going to expose our clients to unnecessary um, earnings risk? And that's essentially where we are today. And hence our bond bullish environment until we see meaningful deterioration of earnings or until we see a meaningful change in the discount rate where it becomes meaningfully lower because the Fed has cut interest rates lower. So for us, it's either meaningful earnings contraction or we a Fed pivot that comes with aggressive rate cuts. Those are the only two scenarios that might entice us to move away from bonds back into equities. But the fact that this particular rally came after a very aggressive bond rally gives us a lot of conviction to remain the way we are from a portfolio positioning perspective. The second argument that has always happened in the past is um, the relationship between a soft economic lending and earnings. In 2001 or 2002, if you look at this particular chart, there was a very mild recession, pretty much a soft lending. And I think this is very convincing evidence that a soft lending is possible. However, what is very interesting is that this soft lending in 2001 and 2002 had no influence whatsoever on the nature of earnings recession. So whilst the economic recession was very soft, 
the earnings recession was very hard with earnings losses of between 40 and uh, 60%. Most of the earnings weakness we've seen so far this year is plus or minus 10 to 15 percent. It's nowhere near the 40 or 60 percent that we saw in 2001 and 2002. What is also very, very interesting is if you look at this chart further to the right and you look at how the Fed has normally behaved in the past, whenever earnings are weakening, you start to realize that today's environment is quite unique in so many regards. So if we sort of look at any particular black line going in the past, you will see that as soon as the black line started to soften, and this is really representing earnings, the Fed immediately started to cut interest rates. So every time again, the um, where, where the black line is softening, the Fed cut rates. Black line is softening, the Fed starts to cut rates. Black line soft softens, the Fed immediately moves into great cut mode. This time around, the black line is softening and the Fed is going higher and higher. So I think our argument is that um, if we had a soft economic recession and a hard earnings recession at a time where the Fed immediately started cutting interest rates after earnings weakness, what more today when they've taken forever to cut because they're still hiking? Again, we're not going to take a stance on whether it's going to be a hard earnings contraction or a soft earnings contraction. What we do know is that there is no relationship between a soft economic landing and the nature and the impact on equity markets. So definitely the Fed could engineer soft landing, but when it comes to the equity market, that is a very different conversation altogether. And this is why, again, the BIP investments team or the investments committee has taken a decision. We, we are not gonna take any earnings risk with our clients hard and money. We're gonna take duration risk rather because the relationship between duration risk and interest rate cuts is a lot cleaner and easier to prove than the one between um, rate cuts and earnings. And for that reason, we're sort of staying bond bullish based on the fact that although these arguments always happen, they're really not conclusive and you are better off positioning portfolios um, defensively. Another very, very interesting argument is, is the Fed even capable of achieving a soft landing? If you really want an answer to that, just go back to this particular paper on the 15th of February, 2007, and just look at what the Fed chairman was saying, projecting a soft landing, and guess what? It did not happen. They had a hard landing on the economy, and they also had a hard landing on the economy and earning side. So essentially, we're just saying a lot of these arguments in every in cycles are similar, but the facts never change. And for us, because there's always an argument, the facts never change. We are pretty much positioning on the facts we understand, the facts we have designed our process and philosophy around. And that is essentially to say when there's the risk of recession is high, when earnings contraction risk is very high, maximize your yield, maximize duration risk, and stay in that posture until you've got much better visibility. We are very, very aware of how the global investments community likes to respond to a problem with the linear brain and only to realize that that they needed a far more complicated brain. You need to look no further than 2020 when, when, reset, when COVID started, there were a lot of linear arguments. It's gonna be contained in China. There are more people dying from suicide and diabetes than COVID. Why should anyone worry? And guess what? It turned out to be a very complicated and very, very exponential problem on economic growth and earnings. In 2022, with Russia versus Ukraine, and guess what many people are saying, it doesn't make up more than 2% of global trade. It's not consequential for global investment strategy. And before we knew whatever was called 2% global trade affected the entire commodity prices and added to inflation risk in a very significant way. And it's not surprising that today the very same global investment strategists are making arguments. There's nothing wrong with the US banking sector. It is very strong. Like we will pass through this. And yet every time there's a problem, the same simplistic linear, linear issue destroys a lot of value. And we're pretty much, again, just making the argument. So when we start to observe this, we start to become more convicted in staying bond bullish, gold bullish in our positioning. And at the right time, we take on earnings risk, but not now. I think it's essentially our underlying message. If you look at this particular chart, it also really increases our conviction. So the chart to the furthest of the right has got two colors or line, two lines in two different colors. The first line is a gold color with a rolling 12 month return of the Fed's interest rate. And it is inverted, meaning when it is moving higher, it means the Fed is cutting rates. And it, when it is moving lower, 
it means that the Fed is increasing interest rates and the blue line is GDP. And I think what is very obvious is if you go back to 1970, the effect on monetary the effect of monetary policy tightening on GDP only starts after 12 months. The Fed started hiking rates around May last year, meaning only now in going into June, are we going to see the effect of all the rate hikes we've started to see, meaning that it can only start getting worse. And the reason why we're saying it can only start getting worse is that this correlation between the rolling 12 month number and GDP is actually very, very tight. It's very difficult to argue against this. And to the extent that we have already seen this rolling 12 month number going this deep, it's very difficult to expect GDP growth to not follow if it always has done so historically. Based on this particular factual observation and that there's always an argument of how long monetary policy takes, when we come back to the chart to the left and you calculate a rolling 12 month number of what the interest rate is, you realize that although the Fed is now at 5% or just close on 5%, on a rolling 12 month number, that number is actually um, like uh, where the solid line ends, which is just about 3%, which means that the rolling 12 month effect of monetary policy is still 200 basis points lower than it actually is in reality, meaning that we need another six or seven months for the rolling 12 month number to catch up with where the Fed is. This means that for the rest of this year, the effect of monetary policy tightening is going to get worse and worse in GDP number. And if history is going to be repeated, GDP numbers are going to get worse and worse and worse. So again, in our view, whilst there's always an argument around this, the effect is factual and the mathematical equation right now shows that there's more pain to come based on prior interest rate hikes. And again, for us, this is not a time to take on a lot of earnings risk, you're better off with bond risk or cash risk, especially now that your cash yields are starting to look really good. And then if we sort of go back again, back into time in 2007, and just kind of start to have an idea of how does the economy respond to the rolling 12 month interest rate as it gets higher and higher and higher? Essentially, how do monetary policy legs affect the global economy and the investing environment? When you look at 2007 as attempted, what is very obvious is that it starts by hitting the housing market, then it moves on to banks, and then it finishes off with the labor market. Essentially, what I'm trying to say to you is that initially, as the 12-month number goes up, the most sensitive to interest rates is the housing market. That's where you see weakness. As this number moves high, it starts to hit the banking sector. And as the policy effects move further, you start to actually see the effect on the labor market. Mind you, I'm not talking about further rate hikes. I'm talking about the current interest rates starting to have an effect because their effect on the rolling 12 month number looking backward is getting higher and higher and higher. And that's essentially the progression. So if our rolling 12 month number is gonna catch up with the current level of 5%, it is very possible we're not gonna escape the sequencing of pain, starting off with the housing market, moving on to banks and then finishing off with the labor market. Now, if we sort of look at what is happening in the current cycle, you can see how the housing market has already been hit. It has been hit faster and deeper than in 2007 because the rate hikes this time around were faster and quicker. And the second estimation by, by BC is that the bank, banks are also gonna be hit similarly. That's already started to happen. If you look at the projection of this slot for the banking sector this time around, what is very obvious to us is that it's also faster and steeper than what we saw in 2007. And no doubt, it probably is going to stay the same for the jobs market. We don't wanna put a lot of emphasis on, this, on the faster and deeper, although that is exactly what is happening. We're putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that it takes a while for the effects of monetary policy to feed onto data. And typically the sequence is it starts with the housing market, the banks, and then the, um, and then the job market. And looking at this progression, it is definitely worse than what we saw in 2007. On that basis, again, we think this is not an environment for earnings risk. We're better off with duration risk or rather just yields on cash, especially because yields are starting to look for far more attractive. If you then look at this particular argument, I'm going to start off with the chart to the left when we had the collapse of best stains. And again, the argument was that um, things are looking fine. Do not take your money out. And then look at FRC, the same arguments are happening. If you look at what is going on so far, um, the three banks that have failed so far in America are pretty much bigger than the 25 that crumbled in 2008. I don't really know what conclusions you can make out of this. 
what is very clear, however, is that there's always an argument, even if the data is really starting to reflect that monetary policy has gone way too far. There's always denial, but the facts eventually play out. And if I just come back to this, I think, and we look at the slope of this, it is possible that we're following the same trends. Now, let's look at what's going on for 2023. If we start off with the housing market, you can see that it has already weakened quite substantially, regardless of the measures that you look at, and, have, and therefore the gray line is a tick. If we then move on to the banking sector, there lo there's a lot of arguments coming out of both ALPA and Macro and VCA that on any measure of banking sector strength, a lot of them had already deteriorated before the blow up that they've seen, and the argument is that there's more to come, and hence this progression that you're seeing. What worries us at BIP is the slop of this deterioration being worse than the slop um, earlier in 2007 and a lot quicker. And I think that is really our concern. And we don't know if we can move our portfolios quickly enough to protect if this should ever uh, worsen. And then if you sort of look, um, continue thing to go um, forward, the next in line is the labor market, which typically is the last shoe to drop. And often for that to happen, you would need to have more of the monetary policy like starting to affect GDP, which brings us back to this particular equation where so far, if you calculate the rolling 12 month interest rate using prior rate hikes by the Fed since last year, the rolling 12 month, month number is currently just lower than 3%. But with each month that we move, the rolling 12 month number picks up high and higher levels until it catches up with the Fed, meaning that we have another 200 basis points to still be fed onto data and as those 200 basis points are, are released from the monetary policy lag, we are expecting the labor market to also weaken. So essentially, we are painting a very negative picture, not because we've taken a stance, but we're just going back into history and we're realizing that these cycles are actually quite similar, although there's different nuances around it. But the most important part is that whenever you deliver medicine, it is going to have common side effects and serious side effects. And everything I've pointed out so far is a very good example of the common side effects and the serious side effects that we're starting to see because of the very aggressive and unprecedented rate hiking cycle we saw since um, in the last, uh, we've seen in the last uh, 40 years. I want to just talk about another argument that is often confusing us at, at the BIP Investments Committee, which sort of makes us very anxious, especially when we're seeing relief rallies where we start to think we're a bit wrong in our thinking. And this is essentially the argument that this time around the US consumer is in a very, very strong space. If you sort of look at this particular chart, I'm gonna focus on where my case is and I'm hoping you can sort of follow with me. What it shows you is that it's the trend line level of consumer wealth. And, um, and essentially, if you then look at the chart below, every time the line is going higher, it means the US consumer has got a lot of wealth benefits and a lot of savings on their side. And every time it's deteriorating, it means the US consumer is losing their spending power. What this particular chart is actually just trying to say is that the most interesting part is that a lot of these gray lines have coincided with times when the US consumer was feeling very wealthy, essentially meaning that there is no relationship again between the savings that a person has and an economic recession. In fact, many recessions or gray lines, if you look at this particular charts in the past, have happened when the US consumer is feeling very wealthy. So whilst we are sympathetic and we become very anxious around how strong the US consumer is, history shows that there is actually no link between the strength or the savings and recession. You can still have a recession even when people have got a lot of savings. And if we then look at the recent trend where the savings are starting to increase, that again is reminding us that although it sounds like a valid argument, it actually has not been able to stand um, the test of time when you when you when you when you juxtapose it to previous recessions. This again is increasing our conviction on the defensive stance we've taken with our client portfolios over the last 12 or 15 months. If we then look at the BCA, which has pretty much got maybe one or six of the strongest strategists in the world, also with the benefit that they're independent and not, and not tied to a bank. And if you just take four conclusions of from four distinct strategists, whilst they say certain things differently, what is very clear in all of their conclusions, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go through like them line by line is that when everything is said and done, and when it comes to asset allocation positioning, many of them are actually bond bullish. What I find very interesting is that the BIP Investments Committee has just committed what we call our quarterly manager analysis, 
we're looking about th at 30 multi-asset funds in the country that are on our buy list. And when we're looking at the trend of risk, even very bullish managers like Coronation in the last quarter have been taking risk off and, and going lower for yield or for bonds. Yes, they still look more aggressive and they're speaking more aggressively than the average manager out there. But from a portfolio positioning, the way their positioning is not different from what these strategists are saying. And if you look at a lot of these, they're pretty much underweight stocks and overweight bonds, again, suggesting that when you've got to face a decision between duration risk and earnings risk, rather take a bet which does very well if the Fed panics because they've destroyed earnings. And essentially, that is duration risk. And a lot of this is, again, consistent with our bond bullish stance, which we have heard for the last 15 months or so. This is also positioning by different strategies, up and macro. And if you sort of look at where they are, they've sort of slightly taken their equities from underweight. They were underweight equities by 10% effective from September. What we don't like about our bond market is that in September, we'd already seen a lot of the downside, and that's when they implemented the underweight. And on the 2nd of April, they implemented an overweight after the October rally. So this for me, or for us rather, is very confusing and it's something that I don't think would get away with that easily with our clients, simply because we don't run paper portfolios, we're running real money. But even with this contentious decision they're making, which we feel is just a trigger happy strategist, if you look at their bond view, they're very bullish on bonds. And again, they all argue, if you look at the particular argument that for where we for where we are now, the, the higher upside in the near term resides with duration risk and not earnings risk. Earnings risk will only start to become bullish once the discount rate, which we get from the bond yield, has, has become lower, meaning that you can only become an equity bullish if the bond market is rallied quite aggressively and is starting to give you a very, a very, um, a very, very low yield. Essentially, looking at all of these different guys, although their arguments are very different, the one thing you cannot take away from their arguments is that currently in the near term, they are bond bullish and not necessarily equity bullish, although their long term view on equities is actually very, very constructive. I'm not going to really spend much time on debates around when the recession is going to start or when it's going to end, because in all honesty, it is not going to change the decision of whether you should be bond bullish or equity bullish in this current in this current um, environment. If we look at the asset allocation direction again of different strategies that we follow, and we come to two thousand and two, you will find that it is a blend of managers that are are negative um, on equities and neutral. But of the two that are neutral, if you look at what they're saying, many of them are in the direction of de-risking all the way to negative. They've obviously taken a chance and stayed invested a little bit longer, but generally the trend is of negative equities and positive on bonds, which again is quite aligned to where we are. And then if you look at um, another argument that is coming out of the BCA, they pretty much coming up with the same argument we made earlier to say, when you are managing inflation lower by destroying aggregate demand, what you're effectively doing is you're, cre it's, um, you're creating a bad disinflation trend and bad disinflation comes because the result of low inflation comes at the cost of an economic recession. And generally that is very bullish for, for bonds and not for equities. And I think the BCA is making the argument to say they suspect that over the, over the coming few months or, uh, of 2023, Every time that we're going to see a lower inflation number, there's a risk that equities are going to rally and investors are going to buy more equities. And they're pretty much saying that is the worst mistake you can ever make because each month that comes with the lower inflation number is confirming to you that the earnings that you might be chasing are going to contract. So pretty much BCA is warning investors to say, don't use inflation to chase equity risk because that is way too late unless you are extremely nimble. And I think the keywords I'm going to really highlight in red are extremely nimble. Many of our clients, you would know whether you've got a fund or fund or a rep portfolios that the speed of execution of those vehicles is extremely slow. You can make a call to sell out of equities now and only to find out that the Momentum platform, the Glacier platform or the Alan Gray platform is frozen for trading over the next two weeks. That is definitely not something I would call extremely nimble. So part of our decision making has to do with the fact that moving asset allocation in a fund or fund or in a rep portfolio 
is quite different from a very flexible manager that is buying and selling stocks on the second. So essentially, we're just admitting that we don't even have the operational ability to move as fast um, as is required in this particular environment. I think VCA is pretty much also just saying, if you're not extremely nimble, rather be defensive because it doesn't really pay um, chasing equities from now. And that's essentially, again, giving us more conviction in how we've positioned the majority of your portfolios. One very, very easy way of deciphering whether we're experiencing good inflation or bad disinflation is to just look at these fast um, economic data signals across different geographical regions and to study the trend at which um, they are moving. So you can see from us that in Q4 2021, the number was actually positive at 0.45 and has become negative, almost touching one. And these, for many of you that are familiar with our risk scores, would show you that the disinflation that we're seeing is coming with bad economic growth, and we would call that bad disinflation. And again, coming back to BCA, they're pretty much characterizing between good and bad disinflation. And bad disinflation is stock equity market negative and bond market positive. And pretty much, again, that's where we are. And interestingly enough, bad disinflation, because it increases the risk of a recession, tends to be dollar bullish until the recession happens and then the dollar starts to weaken. And for many of you, you would know that we increased our offshore exposure and our dollar exposure about three months ago when we bought more DM bonds, DM ILB and global gold, really to reflect that we are positioning for bad disinflation and not for positive. Um, for, for good disinflation. Granted, the BIP team is aware that the dollar is very expensive. Granted, we know that the mean reversion potential is the highest we've ever seen historically. But for as long as we're encountering bad disinflation, I think it would be premature to position for fast weakening of the dollar. However, should the dollar start to weaken by surprise, a lot of the exposures the BIP team has, like global value managers, global small mid cap managers, global gold, emerging markets, Chinese equities, all of those things really do well when the dollar is on a weakening, um, on the weakening foot. So we definitely won't be caught out. It's just that that's not what we are positioned for for the next three to six months. If you look at the same scores across different geographical regions, the only one that you see back in the trend is the China cycle, which is now moved from minus one to minus 0 0.13 and continues to improve which I think all of you, again, will be aware that is the thesis upon which we introduced an allocation to Chinese equities of between 5 and 10% um, over the last uh, three months. So I'm not going to go back to more historical examples and how there's always an argument, but the facts never really change. What I'm going to do maybe is to just pretty much, I think, remind um, us that capital preservation remains our main focus, mainly because the yield curve is inverted. And traditionally, whenever this happens, all the examples I've given you start to play out. They play out gradually, and it really, really requires an investor that is very patient with asset allocation to really preserve the most capital that you can when as this plays out. We also really much are um, expecting earnings recession. We think that the earnings drawdown can be very significant, even if there's going to be a soft landing. And we also don't really want to take a bet on how that's all going to play out for all the reasons we've already taken you through. And on that reason, we again positioning portfolios with less appetite for earnings risk and definitely a lot of tight for yield risk um, and capital preservation. And if for, for many of you, again, our portfolio or our investment decision making does look at a lot of things. So we pretty much look at about seven different areas that affect an investment strategy. However, when the yield curve is inverted, we, we typically suspend anything that requires a strong view of earnings because we don't think you can have a strong view of earnings when the yield curve is inverted for all the arguments I've, reason, I've given reason to, essentially confirming that we are in a euphoric regime. In a euphoric regime, we prefer to be underweight earnings risk or growth assets overweight yield risk, duration risk, or bonds, rather to be simple, and then uncorrelated assets, which is essentially your gold and the US dollar. We are very aware of the relief rallies that typically occur whenever you're defensively positioned. I've already given a lot of examples of how in all prior regimes, you always have them, but ultimately the market appears to sell lower and lower until the ultimate inflation issue has been resolved. We are quite happy, however, to give up on this particular risk and remain well positioned to add our risk as soon as this is played out. And essentially this we think is the more important part 
of the equity market. And to the extent that most BIP portfolios have got up to 20% dry powder, we've got a lot to work with that even if we don't catch all of this, the fact that we preserve more and capture as much of this as possible should help with our risk return outlook over the coming few years. We also quite aware that once you are in this euphoric regime, it typically takes anything between zero and 34 months at the maximum. We pretty much have exhausted a good 12 months or so and have got another 24 months to go. If the particular this particular cycle stays euphoric for 34 months, then we've got another two years to go. But if I, as I've already shown you with how steep the weakening of the housing market has been and how steep that of the banking sector has been, chances are we may not be de risk for another 24 months, but it is a possibility. And I think we're quite prepared for either. And then we're also very aware of the importance of patience from this quant example by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, which I think we've shared with you for the last six quarters, where we're essentially looking at this um, solid blue line, which is the average performance of many investment strategies when the Fed has just started to hike rates. The second one is the average performance of many investment strategies of the Miski World, our All Country World Index when the Fed has just cut interest rates. So this particular one, the flat line here is the, is the performance of the ACQUI on average 12 months after the first red hike, the same after the first red cut, the same after the last red cut. And when you look at the top gray line, the bottom gray line, and this flat average line, what you see is that the upside downside relationship of the ACQUI after the first rate hike and after the first rate cut are really quite poor in the sense that the downside risks are quite material. However, if you look at the same profile in the average 12 months after the final rate cut, what becomes clear is that asset allocation and re-risking are not normally beneficial or profitable if you rush into re-risking after the first rate cut historically have made more money by waiting out to see why is the Fed cutting? What have they destroyed? How long is it going to take for earnings to recover given the damage caused by the Fed? Without those answers rushing back just because the Fed has pivoted, historically has not been a winning strategy. The, the odds that it will work against you are quite high. Whereas when you wait out, you can see how the odds increase meaningfully in your favor, which again is the reason why we're saying we'd rather wait and collect as much yield as we can from bonds and as much capital gains as we can from duration risk. And once we've exhausted that play, we will then uh, come back into equities. Obviously, we can be wrong, but based on a lot of examples we've given, we do think we've got a lot of um, history on our side. I'm going to conclude our arguments, which, as you have picked up, are not really different from what we've been saying for the last 12 to 15 months, except we're using different examples to say the same thing. If you just try and understand what is the risk regime looking like today, the first risk regime you have is your global macroeconomic regime. The problem with the global macro pitch is that if you have very fast in disinflation, you're going to have an aggressive spike in real yields. Real yields are far more dangerous for earnings and economic growth than nominal yields, meaning that if you have a fast disinflation and the Fed doesn't cut rates quickly enough, as they have already said, then the downside on the macro front becomes quite large. However, if the Fed cuts rates very fast, you easily end up with a neutral appetite for equities. All you can tell from here is that the range of possibilities on the macro is still way too wide for us to even consider taking any, any downside risk and hence will remain defensive. When you look at the US dollar, it's looking extremely expensive, but when you look at the US fundamentals versus the rest of the world, the US has got much better fundamentals currently, meaning that the dollar is expensive for a reason. And until US fundamentals are weaker than the rest of the world, the dollar may not weaken. And a strong dollar is the same as a very high interest rate regime and is negative for growth assets. And therefore, from our view, the strength of the dollar is so extreme that you have to be underweight growth assets by anything between 10 and 15%. When you look at the stock to bond market regime, this is pretty much the rolling 12-month performance of equities divided by the rolling 12-month performance of bonds. And historically, it's a very good signal of, an, of helping you to appreciate if your asset allocation should be bullish on bonds, on bullish on equities. And right now, this particular ratio is suggesting that one should be bullish on bonds and negative equities. And then the bond market regime is your typical yield curve. It is, the, is, it is invested, inverted 
at the deepest level it's ever been over the last 40 years, again, consistent with a bond bullish regime. So again, when we simplify things and just go back to hardcore facts, a lot of the risk environment is showing us that the downside risks are still elevated. The downside risks still warrant an underweight to growth assets of anything between 10 and 15%, unless you take a view that the Fed is going to cut rates as soon as real rates are high, but that's not what they're saying. If they pivot in that direction, we will obviously it will affect the scores of a lot of these, these things as they move more towards neutral to bullish. And a lot of you are familiar with our 12 point checklist. It does capture that other risk in case we are wrong. If you then look at our regional asset allocation stance, and I just want to emphasize that this is looking at all asset classes. What I mean by this is if you look at a region like the USA where we are neutral, within the USA, we would be neutral USA as a region, but would be underweight US equities and overweight US nominal bonds, overweight US inflation linked bonds. And the overall result when you look at all asset class is a neutral USA. And essentially what you can pick up is that when it comes to the BIP onshore versus offshore decision, we're pretty much neutral to overweight offshore. You will understand that when we initially started our deal rating exercise, we overweight onshore because of better valuations locally, better yields locally, and a very cheap brand. But with the fast deteriorating macroeconomic backdrop in South Africa, we're not expecting, we, we have become less convicted of local assets and hence the neutral. And then for the clients who have been very bullish on our China call, they would end up with an offshore bias because of the exposure that is higher than average to the Chinese equity market. And by default, BIP portfolios will always have higher EM than PS because EM is a strict allocation in our global equity benchmark. If you then become far more granular and you look at asset allocation, our biggest underweight is South African equities and then US equities or DM equities. The benefit of US equities is that when they sell off, typically the RAND also sells off and it cancels the effect. Whereas with South African equities, South African equities are a high beta market. When global growth is doing very well, South African equities rally better than many equity markets because of the high beta profile they have. And when global growth is weakening, SA equities tend to sell off deeper than other global equities because of the high beta gain. And that high beta, unfortunately, does not have the RAND offset that US or DM equities have, which is why whenever you look at BIP portfolios, they will be underweight SA equities slightly more aggressively than they are underweight your DM and US equities. But nonetheless, these are our biggest underweights. We're also very aware of the strong impact that resources have or the resource earnings are having on the JSE earnings currently and how your commodity prices generally weaken whenever there's a recession and also tend to do very badly when the dollar stays too strong for long. And those things are currently true today. And the best way I think we've just done is to protect capital until there's a dollar weakening environment that is bullish for commodities, which will then change our view where we will move a few of these South African ideas back to neutral. For SA Inc ideas like small caps, mid cap financials is the deteriorating macro environment that has made us conservative, although we understand that the valuations are superior. And although we also understand that valuations over the coming one to three years are a poor market timing tool. And then on the very aggressive side is your bonds, SAILBs, DMILBs, DM bonds, SA bonds, which we have reduced to just share them with DMILBs, Chinese equities and global gold. And I won't really take you through the other ones until we have very specific portfolio discussions. From an investment style perspective, what you will realize is that the moment you have a tilt towards emerging markets in China, by default, these are value regions. So you've already taken a style bet, which is being expressed as a geographical allocation. If you add a, a style tilt to this, you end up with very concentrated risks in your portfolio, which come across as if it's a geographical decision and a style decision. Because on the styles, your value and your small caps are looking better. You, if you look at our scorecard, those are the styles you'd naturally want to be overweight in now. But the problem of that is that you then over-exaggerate your regional bet. And then if you look at um, us, um, other styles like global growth, this is a very high duration bet and it's currently looking very expensive. We already have very high duration in the form of DMILBs and DM nominals. So although you might bring in more growth managers because they do well in a recession, 
what you will be doing in that portfolio is that you'll be exaggerating duration risk without knowing. So if we are going to take a style tilt where we increase our allocation to global growth to overweight, we will have to give up our bond calls. And given how we're very unsure around earnings risk, we would rather keep a neutral style bet within our equity carve out and rather work on the exposure that we have to equities and not take this particular bets. I think the risks are just too uncertain and we've already expressed those risks in much safer places. I'm just going to finalize with how this would all come into a particular BIP portfolio, um, all else equal. I think I'll remind us of the argument to say, given a choice between this, um, a business cycle risk and valuation risk, we respect both. We just know that valuations are poor over the, over the immediate three years and in recession risk is typically a better one over the short term. So if we put a lot of emphasis on business cycle risk or economic recession risk, you will find that our portfolios will end up being positioned like this way. We're 10% underweight South African equities, and that 10% South African equity underweight has been offset by the 10% allocation to the Chinese equity market, for example. We're 2.5% underweight South African property because the benchmark is lower at 5%, and that has gone to ILBs, which are also an inflation asset, except with much less earnings risk. We are overweight South African nominal bonds by 5%, um, all else equal, and that is really because we are underweight developed equity markets by 5%. We're underweight um, global real estate by 2.5% and that has gone to global ILBs. And then we also underweight global credit by 5% and part of that has gone to DM ILBs or DM bonds and part of that has gone to global gold. Essentially, I think this a lot of our clients would have a nuance of this depending on their own business risk appetite. But this is our default positioning when we're taking full consideration of macro regime risk. We are aware that there are certain clients who don't believe in macro regime asset allocation strategies and rather want to continue to focus only on valuations. And they've taken a long term view for those particular clients. Our process can cater for them as well. And what you'll find is that the underweights are far more constrained and they are not as aggressive as when you are taking into account your macro regime risk. But either way, this is now a client preference, but the general direction of risk, I think won't really change that much. The same picture applies when you look at your global specialist building block our strategies. We have a recommended stance for a macro regime adjust, adjusted global balanced fund and one which is really taking more account of valuation risk and less of macro regime risk. Either way, they've got a similar stance just the one is more aggressively adjusted from the strategic benchmark than the other. And then for the portfolios where we blend different uh, balanced funds, we're not taking any style bet, as you can see in the, in the middle. We are aware that global growth style is a high duration style, which should do well if bonds are rallying. And ultimately, it means we should be overweight, but we'd rather take that bet in this 15 to 20% allocation to bonds that we have for this particular strategy. The only bet we're really trying to take here is if the client is willing to get, let go of some of the bonds in favor of um, the Chinese balance fund because of how attractive the Chinese opportunity set is looking like. This pretty much, I think, give, um, take brings me to the end of the arguments we have, BIP Global Investment Strategy. I'm gonna quickly check in the question box and I'm also gonna check if there's any questions that have been sent directly to Eugene or to Olga. And I'm also just gonna quickly open up for questions, but in doing that, I'm automatically handing you back to Eugene as well as to Olga. So I'll just wait maybe for a minute or two for any questions. Otherwise, we're really looking forward to meeting with you. Our meetings kick off tomorrow and we're gonna be on the road for the next month. If there's any specific question you'd like us to address, if you'd like us to forward to you our recommended positioning for your portfolios way ahead of your meetings, please just send an email to us. But many of you will realize that you're already positioned like this because we are not changing anything from what we communicated last quarter. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, back to you, Eugene and Olga, but I'm going to be on standby for questions if there's any. Hi, Tav. There's no questions from my side. I don't see anything in the Q&A box either. Uh, I can maybe suggest that you know, if any of the audience have any questions that they forward it directly to the PIP team or yourself, uh, and we can deal with those questions uh, offline, off the session.
uh, or then more specifically in the upcoming quarterly meetings. Awesome. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, Olga.